All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got John here. Uh, he's a legend. We're, we're just leave it at that. Uh, although, although most people, when you put out that you were interviewing me, their, their number one question was, who, who is this guy? That well, you really- know, you, you <laughs> have to learn the first rule of Twitter, which is never read the comments because yeah. uh, whether they're good or bad, they're not good to read, right? Uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what, let's go through your background before you started Cheddar. You got it. What'd you okay. do? I just go. I just go. Yeah, just go. Have you done okay. a podcast before? Uh, yeah, I think yeah, I've done like Brian Morrissey's Digiday podcast. Yeah. All right. All right. So you're, we're the second podcast you're doing. You just talk and I'll interrupt you and, when you need to shut up. Okay. I give, I give very concise answers too. That's kind of what I, what I do as well. All right. So uh, very winding and meandering uh, career path. Um, the highlights were I was a Disney Imagineer in high school, an intern. I got that through basically writing them a letter as a kid, and it was kind of like the movie Big. So I used to go out to Burbank and work on theme park attractions, and I did that from basically 15 to 20. Um, So that was really cool. Then my career did not so great, and I got stuck being a consultant at Booz Allen after business school. I'm skipping around. I kind of felt like a child star who had had this bright period of time, and then now I was working in an office park in Northern Virginia, Um, and so then I thought my career was over. Um, but then through a series of lucky happenstances, I got hired into Google to work on partnership deals as a very, you know, low level junior type person, but that was good experience. And then a couple other hops and I became president of Buzzfeed. I met Jonah, I became president of Buzzfeed, 15th employee, very little revenue. when I joined, I think we got it to 50 or 60 million when I left four years later. Um, Then I did a stint being president of uh, or CEO of Daily Mail North America, the Mail Online, and then founded Cheddar in uh, 2016, January 2016, started Cheddar. And that's it. Let's talk about BuzzFeed real quick. Yeah. I feel like that was so disruptive when you guys were really scaling. Yes. What was that experience like? The experience of BuzzFeed was that you can have. Each of these startups is a series of bets, right? You place bets. And if one of the big bets works out, you're generally in a good spot. And if two of the big bets work out, then, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like pocket aces, basically, right? Pocket aces, and then you hit like an ace on the flop or something like that. And, and we, we had two bets. And um, the first was Jonah's bet, Jonah Peretti, the founder's bet, that, that social traffic would be enormous. And Facebook would send enormous amount of traffic to sites that created content that worked well on social. And then my bet was that native advertising, creating advertorials, digital advertorials, would be a great advertising product in the face of banners, which were still being sold direct in 2010. And um, for a while, that bet didn't look so good. 2010, 2011 were very tough. Advertising wasn't really picking up. Social traffic wasn't really coming. And then 2012, both hit like, like lightning. And that's what made that work. Got it. And so when you then go to start Cheddar, what were the two bets? The two bets with Cheddar were that live would be a big thing, that people would want live content. Nobody was really doing anything in live. Uh, and that there would be all of these OTT systems like Sling TV and, and what have you um, that would want live content and we could be there. And in this new universe, there would be no difference between us and CNBC and CNN. And also subsequently after a couple different, you know, revenue models, we hit on this kind of live read branded content type product that worked really well as well. Now the part of the bet that I got wrong and it took a while for me to get it wrong, but luckily we corrected it was these free TV systems. That are called fast free ad supported television like Pluto and Roku Channel, Samsung TV Plus. Those became those came out of nowhere like a tidal wave and became giant. And the virtual MVPDs like Sling and YouTube TV, while very important partners to us and and you know incredible systems, didn't have nearly the scale and the growth that the free TV systems would have. But we were we were quick enough to make sure that we were on the free TV systems. And so did that change what the content or just the way you guys approached it? Like what changed when those fast systems came uh, on the market? Well, you know, for a while we had two networks, right? We had one network, which was designed for the pay TV ecosystem. And we had one network, which was designed for the free TV ecosystem. And then during COVID, 
we did a layoff and we also did a collapse of the two networks into one network because, you know, I mean, advertising was very tough during COVID. Um, and so we were able to kind of knit it all together into one thing. But for a while, we were basically operating almost like two parallel networks to service each of these different platforms. Got it. Uh, one of the things that uh, Cheddar was well known for uh, at one point was the um, trading floor location. Yeah. And also the flat iron location. Yeah. Uh, what was the fascination with getting kind of cool, memorable locations to actually record from? Live television is a window on the world. People watch live television in the same way they look out the window, especially when it's news. They want to see like what's going on in the world. And to the extent that you can provide that, there's an aura that comes with it that makes it much more compelling than if you're just in a studio. And so we were covering the stock market and tech companies and the trading floor is the incarnation of business and markets. And also, by the way, all these amazing companies come through there every day to ring the bell. Uh, and so that to me was the most important piece in launching the network was that we get on the floor of the stock exchange and uh, went to Tom Farley, who was the CEO of the New York Stock Exchange at the time, or the president. And I had been on CNBC a lot as a contributor. So he and I had gotten to be acquaintances. And I laid out this vision of what I wanted to create. I wanted to create a CNBC for millennials. And I was going to deliver it in all these new places. And it was going to be on social. And right away, he was like, okay, you know, we don't have much to lose. If, if, if you do well, you can stay. And if it doesn't really go anywhere, we're going to boot you out. And, you know, that was, we got going right away. He put you in like the smallest place I've ever seen. I was on Cheddar once or twice and yeah. literally it was like wedged into what we most people- We the second largest set on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. That set is, CNBC is massive. CNBC has an entire post, right? Yep. Our thing is bigger than what Fox Business has and bigger than what you know Bloomberg has there. So I mean, look, space is at a premium. I mean, the only space more valuable than the floor of the New York Stock Exchange is maybe like you know Park Avenue in the '70s. But like other than that, um, you know, I, I would I would have taken a postage stamp if that's if that was the space that he gave me. Yeah. Well, I was I was going to say like you obviously wanted to be there because where they put you, even if it's the second biggest one, it was just such like a unique spot in between the trading little pits or whatever. Yeah. It's, uh, a, it's like wedged between our space is wedged between two trading pods. Basically it's, it's like, it's almost like if, if we weren't using it, it would basically be storage space. Absolutely. So uh, you also ended up going in a very interesting distribution uh, kind of strategy. So you already talked about the fast systems. You talked about uh, a number of these like OTT platforms. Uh, I remember you did deals. Uh, if I remember correctly, at one point, Cheddar was getting streamed to gas station. Uh, GSTV. We're still in the gas stations. All right. Well, explain that one. So there is this thing called GSTV run by this guy, Sean McCafferty. Great guy. Um, and most gas stations you go to, I find this most gas stations, I mean, I used to travel quite a bit. I don't travel anymore because no one travels anymore. But like most gas stations you go to, on the pump, there's a TV screen. And that TV screen runs commercials and news. And basically, every time I've ever been in your one, the news update it's running is the Cheddar News Update. You know, our anchor, Baker Machado, is, 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 the, is the gas station TV anchor, basically. Uh, and it's great. It gets the brand out there. Um, you know, people hear what Cheddar is for the first time. Everybody makes fun of it, which means they're seeing it. You know, people make fun of you. That that's when you really know that you're uh, that, that they that they know who you are and they're hearing you. It's when they make fun of you. Absolutely. Uh, another deal you did was uh, at one point you were getting like licensed or streamed to college campuses. I think if I okay, remember. I still have that. So we bought from Viacom. Viacom had this thing called MTVU which is screens that are in cafeterias, gyms, and student unions that were hard-coded to MTV, basically, playing music videos. We bought that from them. It's 1,400 screens on 400 campuses and changed it to Cheddar, and we call it Cheddar U. And so we have the largest, basically, college network, the large, largest college audience, place-based college audience of anybody through having Cheddar U. So we have that as well too. Look, I've been obsessed with distribution. I mean, you're, if your content is great, you know, and it's not distributed properly, um, no one's gonna see it. And there's a lot of content that's so-so, but has great distribution. 
and, you know, gets seen by plenty of people. And so, you know, distribution is probably more important than content and content's probably number two. Uh, there's a Y Combinator saying that first time entrepreneurs worry about product, second time entrepreneurs worry about distribution. And I think that that's, you know, a perfect example here. How did that change the conversation with advertisers? One, just as you got larger and larger, I'm sure that helped, but two, around where you have the distribution. So it's one thing to say, hey, people are coming to our website. It's a whole other thing to say, you know, gas stations, college campuses, yeah. OTT, et cetera. Well, the most important thing that's happened now is we have enough scale on these fast systems that we can run standard 15 and 30 second commercials, right? And that's really important because advertisers want simple turnkey solutions, right? Where we've continued to struggle is with measurement, which is that there's no Nielsen number for all the places we're in. There's no single comm score number, although we're getting comm score. And so that, that's been, measurement has probably been one of the greatest difficulties of the business, has been probably the, the most great difficulty. Got it. Uh, you eventually sold the business uh, for a big number. Um, I'm assuming you, other shareholders did very well in that. Uh, why'd you sell it? Well, so, you know, actually what's interesting about it is I, I think we did well for the investors and I think it was a great outcome. The people who put in early money made a great return on it. I think that for a lot of our investors, you know, it wasn't quite a Silicon Valley return because they didn't get to put as much money to work as they would, would have liked. And so I, I think that, you know, the investors were happy and I think that I have a great relationship with them and I, they would certainly... Uh, back me again, but you know most firms are looking for multi-billion-dollar exits, and you know a two hundred million-dollar exit doesn't really move the needle for most of these firms, right? So um, that's just a bit of a side note. Why did I sell the business? Because I looked out, and everything was getting bigger and more consolidated, and um, you know NBC Universal was owned by Comcast, Fox was sold to Disney. Um, you know we were always the only independent you, you look you look on hulu live or you look on sling and it's cnbc which is owned by at&t it's um msnbc which is owned by comcast it's and, and and you know when i started the company i felt a bit like i was running around with a bb gun and everybody else had you know muskets right and then it, over the course of four years it began to feel like you know I no longer had a BB gun. Maybe I had like a slingshot now because, you know, we had, we had improved, but they had developed, you know, extensive arsenals of weapons. Right. And so we, it, it was natural to link up with them. And it was also natural to link up with Altice because they were exclusively news focused. You know, the other part of the portfolio is news 12, these hyper local news stations. So the company had basically decided that they were going to be in telecommunications, broadband, television, you know, telephony, uh, and news, and they weren't going to be in dramas and comedies. And so this was the perfect kind of addition to that portfolio. Uh, I had had Altice as investors, I think, for three, two, three years at that point. So they knew the company inside and out. Um, and it was the right time. And, you know, also, I mean, COVID, COVID ended up coming as well, too. Now, I didn't know COVID was coming, but I'm, I'm certainly lucky to have the support of a large corporate parent to kind of get through COVID. Whereas I think that would have been unbelievably difficult as a standalone startup. So, you know, that, that I can't really claim that that factored into the decision, but I think it certainly made the decision more right in retrospect. A lot of people in America, I don't think know about Altice. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Actually, let me answer your question a little more about why okay. I, I sold as well too, is that, you know, I, I really think that, you know, I've told Jessica less in this when she interviewed me is that media is really about, you know, independent media companies are like drug discovery, you know, you, developing a drug. You've heard me say this before. No, but uh, I, I can already see where this is going and I like it. So keep going. And so you develop a great drug. So let's say cheddar, we, we developed an amazing drug for uh, arthritis, great, great arthritis drug. We had great scientists. We developed a great arthritis drug, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now we have a choice. We have to go through FDA trials. Now that's going to cost gajillions of dollars. Then we need an entire pharmaceutical sales force. Then we need an entire, you know, production line to get this thing out there. And for most media companies trying to do that is a mistake. They're literally reinventing the wheel and they're reinventing the wheel when people already have a wheel. And the only unique thing that they've really brought to the table is their unique new drug that they did through R&D. And so that's why it is the right decision for Morning Brew 
to sell to Business Insider for, you know, I, I can't remember, what was the number quoted? 75? Uh, I think that is the alleged number, yes. Right, because I mean, what are they going to do? Build an entire sales force, build an entire CMS, build a research division, build a, all these things that Axel Springer and Business Insider have. Um, and look, the history of media companies, independent media companies, is that, that they get too large. They've, they've built up this infrastructure. The infrastructure is not necessarily as doesn't have the margins that the other people have, the incumbents have, and then they're sort of too big, basically. I mean, that's that's what happens when you get too big in media. Yeah. Uh, Patrick Drahi, who uh, I think yes. owns Altiz. Controlling uh, character. Okay. He fascinates me because he's a multi-billionaire. Uh, there are almost no interviews with him anywhere. Yeah. Uh, I'm seeing him tomorrow for breakfast. I'll tell him that you uh you should tell him to come on the show for sure. Uh, yeah, but, unlikely, but, unlikely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I figured it's unlikely. Uh, what, what's it been like uh, or kind of what have you learned from being around somebody like that who I think just most people look and say, look, he's built this amazing, very large uh, company, obviously one that you found attractive to kind of partner with and, and, and go work with. Um, kind of anything there in terms of just the way that the company operates or, or Patrick specifically? So he's a genius, you know, and and, and I would say the culture, most of my interaction, I'm, I'm privileged to be able to interact with Patrick on a routine basis. And But my boss is Dexter Goey, who's the CEO of Altice, right? And Dexter's been working with Patrick for a very long time, I think over a decade or something like that. And the way Patrick and Dexter work is they're very calm, they're very steady, and they have a sense of humor um, about everything, right? And they know their numbers cold. And that's basically, and also, you know, they understand that that most businesses are operated inefficiently, and there is margin to be derived from almost from almost any business, right? And so, that steadiness, that facility with my numbers. I mean, you know, I'm going to see Patrick tomorrow. I'm walking in there. This is just a casual catch up. I'm walking in there with a, a stack of printouts like this. And my laptop, because like he's just going to ask me some number, you know, <laughs> and uh, and it's always a little bit like um, an exam. But you know, I did well in school, and I, I know how to study. So you know, I love it. What's the biggest focus for you right now uh, at Altice as you kind of scale the business? You know, we we have two advertising products that I'm really trying to grow. You know, we, we have the local advertising business, which is selling um, spots throughout our footprint on our cable system. Uh, and that that's a, a very steady business that's doing quite well. And then we have the emerging products, which are basically the cheddar product, the sponsored content. And we're also selling, we have an advanced advertising division that allows us to sell national advertising that can be targeted and have conversion tracked by IP. So I would say innovation in that. Um, I would say that from the content standpoint, News 12, we've done an extensive kind of rebrand and re-graphic and re-modernization of that over the past few, um, over the past year, really. And then with Cheddar, um, you know, trying to make, figure out these fast systems, figure out which ones are going to be the biggest, making sure that we're there, making sure we have the channel position. You know, we launched on Tubi, we launched Cheddar and News 12 on Tubi um, last week, which is kind of amazing. I've been pushing the Tubi folks for a long time to do news because I felt like it was one of the giant platforms that didn't have news. Um, but I'd like our content to be everywhere on these fast systems, even the ones like, you know, Peacock that haven't put us on yet. So uh, before we get into kind of a couple of topics, I'm just going to throw out and you mind dump on us your thoughts. Yeah. Uh, what about Netflix, Peacock, you know, these other platforms? Um, do you see them eventually adding news and, and you guys being a contender there? Or do you think like maybe a, a Netflix just they'll never get into anything? So that I was in, I, I was in a, uh, somebody held a thing with Reed Hastings. I think one of my professors and I asked a question. I said, Reed, I've been, and I, I've had two interactions with Reed in the past, however many years. One was at DLD in Munich. And then the last was this one a few weeks ago. And in both cases, I asked him, when are you going to do news? And in both cases, he told me, you know, no plans. Right. And so I don't see them doing it. Peacock has some news on it. You know, they have, they have the NBC Universal news on it. Whether or not they open it up to other people's news is yet to be seen. Amazon, we have a great relationship with. Amazon on, on the Fire platform has Fire News, 
So it, it's, a, it's a dedicated square on, if you have a fire stick and we're one of the news providers there. So in some ways that's an alternative to Prime. Um, and so, you know, and, and Disney Plus, I don't really see doing it. I mean, look, it bums me out. It bums me out that, you know, Netflix and Disney Plus, like two of the biggest and fast growing, um, don't have news. What bums me less is if they decided tomorrow to put on news, um, they would do one of two things. Either Disney would decide they were only doing ABC, okay? Or if they decide to let other people on, we would definitely get the phone call because we always get the phone call when people decide they want to put news on because we have a high quality product and it's free. And that's a, that's, that's a winning combination um, for people that need news content. Makes sense. Uh, you've been live video uh, at Cheddar for a long time. Talk to me about audio. Do you guys rip the audio from the videos and put them out as podcasts? Have you thought about podcasts? Kind of what's going on there? So we do the audio simulcast we do on TuneIn and iHeart and a few others. Uh, we don't get very good statistics on it. I don't really know what the list, listenership is there. Podcasts I, I've completely stayed away from. You know, it's too competitive. Um, it is personality driven. Uh, and you either need a big personality uh, that draws an audience or true crime. And those seem to me to be like the two categories that really work, right? And, um, you know, we... Cheddar was always an, an ensemble cast type thing, always more of a, a news type thing. And we don't have the stars is really the wrong word. We don't have the, the people like Barstool has that are able to really gather loyal followings kind of by personality. And so that would make a per, that would make a podcast. I think very hard for us to do newsletters. We, we bought Need to Know, you know, which was kind of like a smaller version of the skim. I think it has three or 400,000 subs. Uh, it does okay for us. But, you know, look, you can only do one thing when you're a startup, really, you know, and you can, not that we're a startup anymore. Now we're part of this larger thing. But really, video has been my sole focus for the past four and a half years, and I think is going to be my sole focus for the, for the, for the coming future. Um, I think that we're the best at live video. I think that we have made it our sole focus. And I think that that's where we're going to continue to focus, you know, certainly for another year or two. What, what about outside of you guys, right? So you guys say with live video, but what do you just think about kind of the rise of newsletters and, and this whole kind of uh, phenomenon that's going on? Yeah. I mean, you and I have talked about this before. I think the amazing thing about the newsletter thing is that if you're a writer um, and you're part of a media company and you can go sign up a thousand people at a hundred dollars a year, you know, that's pretty incredible, right? And I'm not sure how many people can do that, but look, you just, you know, Casey from The Verge just left to go. He's, he's on Substack? He is. Yeah, and he's going to probably make more money than he makes at The Verge, and he's probably going to have uh, a better lifestyle and make more money and, you know, and own 100% of what he creates. And so um, I think it's really disruptive to, to, printed, to print journalism. Print, yeah. you know, print digital journalism. Absolutely. What, what about uh, other forms of video? So not live video, but whether it's kind of the TikTok and short form type stuff, whether it's more of like the vlog and, and the longer form stuff on YouTube, uh, but just things that aren't live news based. How do you think about that? I think that, you know, there hasn't been a lot of, the YouTube thing is, we do some YouTube, we do some explainers on YouTube and, and they do, they do plenty well. Um, there hasn't been a lot of innovation there really, you know, and TikTok, we were really big on TikTok for a while. We still have a million four followers on TikTok. Cheddar does. We do our gadget videos there. Monetization really isn't there, you know, either. And then, you know, for a long time from my Buzzfeed days to my early Cheddar days, you know, we were, we were going places where we could get growth and get the brand out there. And it was exciting and, and it was the right thing for the company at the time. But now, I'm just much more focused on the economics of these things. Of, you know, does it make financial sense for us to be spending time on this? And so many of these platforms are still, you know, are, are still nickels and dimes, if that. I mean, TikTok isn't even nickels and dimes. Yeah. Uh, 
all of these different platforms uh, are kind of benefiting from the rise of the creator, right? I think that we've always thought about that as like, oh, the YouTubers and, and people who had kind of more uh, creative type skills, and they probably lack some of the business, um, you know, interest and uh, scalability and, and skill set. Now it almost feels like we're getting the opposite, right? We've got tons and tons of business minded folks who uh, are starting to be able to build audiences because of these platforms, reducing the friction to doing that. Uh, you mentioned Barstool. There's a couple of others that are kind of leaning into uh, this overlap between the creator or personality and uh, and audiences and monetizing it. How do you kind of think through, maybe not for you guys, but other media companies? Is that something yeah. where they're going to lean in hard on? I think the way that you would do this is, look, I'm reading the same articles everybody's reading. You know, the one that Taylor Lorenz at the New York Times just put out about the TikTokers that are making millions of dollars and get free cars to free car leases from Triller and, you know, all, all this stuff. And I think that it goes one of two ways, either. And look, my kids, my 10 and 11 year old, they love Charlie D'Amelio. Like that's like, that's their favorite person. Right. And so I think it goes one of two ways, basically these Uber stars on these short form platforms are able to continue to get influencer type sponsorships and do deals and stuff like that. <clears throat> and if that happens, I think they will, some of them will choose to be rolled up into a company, not dissimilar from what we saw during, you know, with the, M the MCNs and YouTube back in the day, where, where all the YouTube stars got rolled up into these companies, and then there were various squabbles, and it didn't really work, and then they really, they all decided to unbundle. You know, it's sort of interesting. I mean, it, it's like Substack is basically the debundling of writers with, with the... TikTok stars, they're all debundled and individuals and out there doing their influencer deals. And then the question is, what makes sense to, to roll up and bundle into uh, a company? And I imagine somebody, if not already, will take a pass at making a company basically out of TikTok stars. What about monetizing through non-advertising and non-subscription? So subscriptions become popular with things like Substack, right? For kind of emails and, and that. Advertising is a, a known thing. What about things like uh, either uh, in more endorsement type models, uh, maybe even uh, joint ventures or physical products? Like we've seen creators on YouTube who maybe can't monetize very well on that platform. Yeah. They've had to get creative. Does the large media companies almost use these creators as like R and D and just take the best practices and start to monetize in other ways as well. Well, who's the first creator that, that comes up with the next all birds, right? Like that, that would be super interesting to see that happen. And we've seen all these D to C companies that are doing well, that make a single product that kind of reduce the choice for the consumer, which is really compelling because I think people want less choice. They want to be told these are the shoes to get, not like, you know, select from any number of these shoes, right? And and so I, I think that's a viable model. I think many of the other things you talked about are really kind of just advertising in in another in another word, basically sponsorships or brand. I mean, it's that that's all basically forms of advertising. But when you get right down to it, you basically have three avenues for monetizing media, as far as I can tell. You've got to your point, subscription, advertising, and e-commerce. The bloom is a little bit off of e-commerce. I mean, there were a bunch of media companies that went into it, but basically Amazon took down the affiliate payments that they were giving people. These e-commerce things typically have very low margin because selling physical products has very low margin, which is why there's Amazon and basically nobody else. Um, but there may be this little carve out of these D to C high end custom products that influencers may be able to get into and may make e-commerce a go. But look, advertising and subscription have been around for you know hundreds, if not a thousand years, basically, as the two major forms of media monetization. Yeah. I, I keep thinking about this idea of, you know, Joe Rogan rather than uh, have the sponsor Traeger Grills, he should have just said, Hey, I want the Joe Rogan grill. It's a Traeger grill with the Joe Rogan logo. He sells it through to his audience, owns equity, gets a higher percentage than just the ad dollars. Or you even go to, you know, uh, take a D to C company like maybe Casper, right? I don't know their exact numbers, but somewhere where there's very high cost of acquisition and you almost have them eventually get bought by like The Rock. And The Rock says, hey, this is the best mattress. I work out hard and then I go to sleep every night and you can drastically reduce the I, cash. I wonder how much of, of the economics of that are already captured through advertising and through referral. And you know, the interesting thing about Joe Rogan is so I, I started listening to Joe Rogan 
uh, only two weeks ago, just because I kind of wanted to, you know, I just, just Who'd you happened. listen? What, what episode uh, did you listen to? I listened to the one where he was talking to a, a psychologist about narcissism. Okay. Then I listened to the episode where he was talking to Colin Quinn. Yep. Okay. okay. So you haven't listened to any of the super, super uh, out there ones yet? No, I just want to listen to the most current ones, right? Okay. And, um, and I had listened to parts of the Elon Musk one a little way back when. Um, I was shocked by how many live read commercials he had at the beginning. He has like seven minutes, eight minutes, I mean, right? Oh, yeah. And But what I recognized is, oh, all you have to do is just skip to the you, – you just drag the slider and you don't have to listen to eight minutes of sponsors. So I don't know how sustainable that really is. And, and, and I mean his, his podcasts are super long, so I've never listened through, but there's no commercials in the middle, right? None. So uh, – but, but he's using referral codes. So, I mean, I guess most people don't skip the commercials, and I guess he's getting great brands to do this stuff with him. Yeah. So, you know. I mean, look, it, it, it is fascinating, right? I mean, everybody who's a loyal listener knows you can just hit the fast forward button, you hear the music, right? And then you kind of just undo it and that's where the episode is going to start. But again, you know, how many people actually fast forward? But, but I'm sure some to, percentage. But back to what you're saying, you know, on the grills, right? Which is, you know, I believe he's capturing the vast majority of the economics of his contribution to, what, what's the name of the grill company you mentioned? Tra Traeger Grills is his big, one of his big sponsors. Traeger? Traeger. Traeger. T -R -A -E -G -E -R. T-R-A-E-G-E-R. Traeger. We're running ads for him right now. Look at us. Yeah, I, I think that he's, he's capturing the value he's creating for Traeger because they're probably paying him a very high referral per grill, right? I'm not sure him going through the trouble of buying or owning the grill company or starting the grill company would really work. Although... Ironically, we're talking about grills and, you know, George Foreman, I, 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 I suspect that the F George Foreman grill worked out very well for him. I mean, he did it for many years. Obviously, it, it must have been working. And, um, you know, maybe it's a little bit of experimentation of both. I mean, I do think there are categories that are super cheap to produce in where brand is really important and Rogan could be very successful because he's also all about like health and martial arts and things like that as well, too. And he does a commercial. One of his commercials is for a... Uh, a supplement or, or a greens type drink, you know, I bet a lot of people would buy Joe Rogan vitamins or Joe Rogan, you know, he, he actually uh, is a equity owner in uh, in a company that, uh, so they have, they yeah. have natural greens or something. I think it was, uh, Oh, maybe he ran an athletic greens, athletic greens, athletic greens. Okay. So he's not an equity owner there as far as I know. Uh, okay. He's got, he's got a different company. Um, the areas that you're most interested in outside of live television, we could talk about all these different things. Like, where do you see the biggest opportunity? If you were going to go restart a, a new media company today, where, where would you look? I think that well, media is not where media is not the the only media ideas I have kicking around in my head are the media ideas for my my job. Really, just because it kind of sucks up so one only has so much media frontal lobe, right? I think financial services there's a lot to be done in financial services. And I think that you've seen parts of the stack already being taken apart and being done by startups like Lemonade for insurance or Robinhood for stock trading or Acorns for saving. And I think that's really just the tip of the iceberg. I think that there is, you know, I, I was actually looking at um, Wealthfront for the first time last night, a friend of mine pulled up Wealthfront because, you know, Wealth management is one of the areas that's kind of interesting to me. And I was surprised by sort of how basic it was and how many things you couldn't do. And so to me, I think that we'll, you know, we'll see every, every type of insurance and every type of financial product startupized. And that's much earlier innings, I think, than what we've seen in media. The other thing I'll tell you is, you know, I bought a used car over the summer through Carvana. And, you know, I can't imagine ever going back to buying a car any other way. I mean, so, you know, that's an example too of, of just, just how much things can be done online and differently and in a modern fashion. So uh, I had a, um, uh, one of the founders of Carlipso, which was bought by uh, Carvana, come on. And this week I've recorded three podcasts where the guest mentioned buying a car on Carvana this year. Yeah, right? you, I mean, just exploding. The selection is not even that good. Like the selection's not that good. I wanted a pickup truck and like they only had like a handful that fit like low mileage and what I wanted and, you know, the super cab and all that type of stuff so I could fit the kids in it. But they make it so easy and 
you know, there's no fighting over the price. The price is set. You can go and check the blue book to make sure that it's, you know, it's within range. And it's, and, and I had gone, I had gone to a dealership before and I was immediately, you know, arguing with the guy over price and the prices didn't make any sense. And it's a far better experience. I mean, I can't imagine why anyone would do anything other than buy a car online. Yeah, it, uh, it makes sense. You've been, uh, heavily involved in the startup world and in investing. What are some of the other themes that you find interesting right now or that you're looking to invest in? So I don't really invest that much. I, you know, I, it's very rare that I do investment. For me, I love operating and I find investing to be really frustrating because I just want to take the steering wheel, you know? And I think that like, you know, so I don't in the few things that I've invested in, but mostly it's a relatively uncomfortable thing for me. So I, I like uh, personal finance is super interesting. Um, connected fitness, I, I don't think is tapped out yet. Peloton and Mirror, you know, are, are great and are big, but I don't think they're the only ones that can come into that. I think that that's a mega trend that's here to stay. Um, I think that there will be more fast TV services. I don't think we're done with that yet. I don't think there's enough of them. And I think that they'll be customized to different interests and likes. Um, coffee recently, I've, 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 uh, experimented with coffee. There's, there's two coffee startups that interest me. Uh, I'm not an investor in either. They're just interesting. One is Jot Coffee, which is super concentrated coffee. Then you just put another, the other is this thing called Cometer, which is frozen. It comes frozen. The coffee, the coffee pods come frozen. You boil a cup of water, you put the coffee pod into it. Um, that's, that's, uh, it, are you a big coffee drinker? Yeah, I'm a big coffee drinker. Yeah, I, I even All have right. a coffee tattoo. No, you don't. Really? Yeah, I do. I'll pull it. You, you, you pull For those it. who are just listening, we're about to see a, a coffee tattoo. Oh, he, he legitimately has a coffee tattoo on I've got, his, one, uh, I got a coffee tattoo. So it's like All the right. yin and the yang of life. And then that's scotch. Scotch. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Although, uh, although, although I'm not drinking now, I am doing like the dry. Uh, sober October. October? Sober October, yeah. All right. Dry October. <laughs> How many cups of coffee do you have a day? I've ebbed and flowed over time because, you know, my doctors want me to have less, um, but I have three, four cups of coffee a day. All right. This is a really important thing, like like literally breaks friendships. Are you an iced coffee drinker? I, I saw your tweet about that. I saw your tweet about that. Do yeah. you drink iced coffee? I drink iced coffee. You're do right. Do you drink iced coffee in the winter? Yeah, of course. All right. We're course, friends still. I, I, I think that basically <laughs> iced coffee is the afternoon beverage. So like, you know. Uh, oh, do you go hot coffee in the morning and iced coffee in the afternoon? Yeah. I, I need to warm myself up. I need to warm up my, my chili bones in the morning. You know, like I need a hot coffee. You know, I do, I do believe that consuming a cold beverage on a cold day in the morning and then I walk my daughter to the school bus. Like, you know, it'll put a, it'll put a chill in you if you have an, a, you know, an iced coffee first thing in the morning. I don't think I know a single person who goes hot and cold in the same day. Do you have, do you use an ultra concentrate coffee? No. Yeah, you should, you, you would love it. I mean, it's, it's actually perfect for iced coffee. What are you brewing? Are you cold brewing or what are you no, doing? I, I get my ass up and I walk to Starbucks and I go <laughs> and I order coffee you and I walk back. Dunk, you should be going to Duncan, my friend. My, my great partner, Duncan, is where you should be going. Listen, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, everyone knows America runs on Dunkin'. America runs on Duncan. Cheddar <laughs> runs on Duncan. <laughs> All right. I asked the same two questions to everybody before we finish up, and then you get to ask me one to finish it. Uh, first one is, what's the most important book you've ever read? It's a great question. Atlas Shrugged, probably. Atlas Why? Shrugged. Why? Because I think that, I think Ayn Rand is widely misquoted and misunderstood and people basically use it as an excuse for being totally capitalistic and having no social welfare net. And I don't, I don't buy into any of that. I, I believe the society needs to take care of its, of its population and the capitalism alone is not perfect. So I'm not, I'm not like crazy on it, but the notion of the creator and the value that the inventor brings to society and the role that capitalism plays in moving a world forward really spoke to me. And so that book was sort of formative in kind of how I, I, I think I shaped my entrepreneurial mindset. So there was that book, Catcher in the Rye, I, I really like a lot too. Um, the idea that, that as we all come of age, there's this discomfort in adjusting to the old, the, the adult world and figuring out where one fits in. Um, 
Robert, Mo Robert Caro's book, The Power Broker, about Robert Moses, about how cities get built. You know, and Robert Moses was a, was a terrible person, but the book is an amazing book to understand how cities get built and the politics that go into them and how, pro how complicated projects are executed. Um, I gave you three books, I guess. Those are all great ones. Second yeah. question, more fun. Aliens, are you a believer or a non-believer? I'm a, I'm a complete believer. Why? I'm a complete, just because I think that if the universe is infinite, that the likelihood that we are the only intelligent life form is just, you know, it's just not possible. It's just not possible. And, um, and, I, and I do think that, you know, when you, when you hear about the sightings that people have had and the experience that people have had, there's a striking similarity in you know, close encounters of the third kind. There's a striking similarity in all of this stuff. So, but you know, I, I, I tend to be more open-minded. Um, you know, I am, I'm religious, you know, I'm Jewish. I believe in God. I believe that there are things that happen that are outside of our control and that there are forces in the universe that we don't understand. And so I think that aliens sort of plays into that. Look, aliens, you know, the, the other possibility is, that we are all in a, in, a, in a terrarium or a fish tank on an alien's counter, right? I mean, you know, when you have pets, like my cat, my cat's understanding of the world is very, very strange. You know, she, she's in this, she's an indoor cat. Her universe is this apartment and her, her other universe used to be a different apartment when we moved. I mean, yep. How does my cat possibly, my, well, first of all, my cat doesn't even bother trying to process that. Yeah. So I started asking the alien question because one night I was laying in bed and I had this really intelligent epiphany, which was, do you think aliens have pets? Like you, ha you have a cat, right? Yeah. yeah. But like if the aliens showed up, are they showing up with like multiple species and, and there's uh, pets involved? Well, you know, where my thought first went to is, you know, do they have livestock? Do they have working animals and animals that they breed for food? And the likelihood is that they are more advanced than us and they've probably already moved off of a, you know, an animal-based diet. They probably are on only a plant-based diet. So I would suspect that the aliens show up without pets or livestock. They That's also probably don't travel with them contrarian view there, my friend. All right. What question you got for me to finish this up? Who's the most interesting person that you've ever interviewed? The most interesting person I've ever interviewed. Um, you, so interesting is hard because it's because everyone finds different things interesting, but the person that I think uh, was the most misunderstood and I walked away and I said, I could talk to that person for hours and hours and hours and like never get tired of talking to her is Kathy Wood from ARK Invest. Um, just, I done two interviews with her. The first one was like $300 Tesla stock price. She was giving the whole innovation story and she was getting hammered by everyone. Uh, and you never know, like when people go on television and stuff, you're kind of like, hey, do they, how, how much do they believe what they're saying? And, and kind of what's that conviction look like? And uh, I remember coming out of the first conversation being like, that woman really understands technology trends, really understands innovation, really has kind of that independent thinking and first principles thinking. Um, and then the second time we did it, uh, Tesla had run. Um, so everyone kind of shut up about that. Now they were on to the next thing, you know, saying that, that she was wrong on. Uh, but I just think that it's fascinating to find somebody who's had a very long storied career uh, and reached a point where like, she's probably just as hungry now as she always was uh, and just enjoys playing the game. Right. And so it's just like all those little pieces to it. She'd probably be the answer. Good answer. All right. Where can people find you on the internet? John Steinberg on Twitter. All right. We're gonna have to do this again in the future. I think I feel like uh, maybe I'm gonna have to come back with like a coffee tattoo or something myself now to uh, to one up. Or an iced coffee tattoo. <laughs> All right, we'll do it again in the future. Pleasure. Thanks for the time.